All right. Hey, welcome everyone. We are live and uh, welcome Dr. Klingat. And uh, today, let's see. So people are still coming on. So usually we have a little, we allow a little bit of time. <laughs> um, so uh, the three cure followers are already greeting us, which is very lovely. And yeah, yes, thanks. Hi, every, hi, everybody. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, we are, it's a special thing for, uh, for the Klinger Institute and for the Dietrich, I hope, because we are live from a different location. As you can see, it's really good to see you in daylight, actually, <laughs> because normally I'm in England and we do this uh, in the evening. And uh, so for us, it's a special occasion, also because um, we are live from a very special place, which... Uh, Dietrich, you can tell us where we are. So the word yeah. is yours now. Yeah, so we were both invited to um, teach at a, a very, very highly regarded cancer clinic that's called Hope for Cancer uh, in Mexico. And um, Tony uh, Jimenez is the leader here, the medical doctor who has become a dear friend. And he invited us to uh, do some teaching here to his staff and also today to patients and so it was, we feel both very honored to, to, to be here. And so, um, and because we're really teaching full time, we just simply integrated our, this talk today, the Parasite talk <laughs> into what we're doing here. And so I will um, modify my talk a little bit accordingly. Um, and um, this place, Hope for Cancer has emerged for us as really one of the cleanest, bestest uh, places in the world for where I would go to if I needed to. Um, I'm not promoting anything or anybody or so, but it's a wonderful experience here. And of course, after a year and a half of lockdown, um, we're really, really grateful to be here in Mexico where things are a little bit more human, a little bit better, a little bit more free. There's the beach where we can go to without the face mask and where we can breathe and uh, where we can talk to regular people and so it's been wonderful. <laughs> okay, thank you Dietrich for this introduction and thank you again to Dr. Tony Jimenez and uh, Hope for Cancer which is a beautiful healing place and to his team as well. Great doctors, uh, wonderful people all ready to heal and help others so really lovely. Um, right, I think we're all on now and uh, so the floor is yours, Dietrich, you are uh, you're on. Okay, so uh, to catch you up, um, it's been my experience uh, for the last 30 or so, 30 some years. I've been practicing medicine for 47 years, but I've been fully parasite aware since my years in India, which ended <coughs> in 1982. So ever since then, I've been looking at parasite in the Western world. And at the time, there was almost no other voice out there. Like uh, the doctors that I knew in the US and Germany all assumed parasites are a problem from over there, south of the border, somewhere in Africa, South America, but they're not a problem in the West. And as it emerged, um, for me looking at parasites in every patient, we found a lot of it. And we saw amazing, amazing healings and improvements from doing that. And so I want to convey like a little bit of the knowledge that I've gained to you to um, sharpen your, your view, your eyes for it and consider it more often than you have in the past. Um, uh, maybe last, before I get going, um, there was a joy to me about 15 years ago to discover one other doctor in the US, that is the wonderful Simon Hugh in St. Louis, who has been even ahead of me uh, in looking at parasites and has discovered the antiparasitic remedies as a treatment for chronic fatigue, as a treatment for Lyme disease, has discovered the antiparasitic remedies as a powerful non-invasive treatment for cancer, or at least co-treatment for cancer. So. I'm, um, and so we find each other, you know, worldwide. There's only a few people. There's a, um, a leading parasitologist in Germany whose name I'm not even allowed to say, 
who found that in Germany, uh, parasitic disease is widespread amongst the population. And he basically got a gag order from the government. He cannot publish on it. He cannot talk about it. And so there's also the sinister side to it. So let's see, let's hope that my PowerPoint will work. Um, so let me get the... Come on. Okay. So um, I'm going to quickly go through with the uh, last last week we talked about some of the main classes of parasites that we worry about so there is the one with many cells that we call worms you know there is the round worms the tapeworms and the flat worms and the hook worms you know so there is four different classes of worms that we're engaging with they're all present in the western population and um aside from that is the monocellular parasites leading is giardia and amoebas but malaria is of course the most well-known one because mr gates has invested a lot of money in it and gets a lot of press because of it but there's other parasites that are much more relevant in our western world like giardia and amoebas and toxoplasmosis um, things that are widespread causing huge amount of illness um, that is rarely uncovered by your regular physicians and the worst obstacle <laughs> and I'm like to talk about personal experience. I had a patient where I diagnosed a particular type of tapeworm. The patient freaked out and went to the university to the department of parasitology. And so the, the professor sent me a very threatening letter back um, that i am lost my mind and that I'm diagnosing a parasite that certainly the patient doesn't have and doesn't even exist in our sphere here. And so the patient came back to me feeling very guilty that she's kind of has disclosed my diagnosis to this professor. And so patient went ahead with my treatment. She delivered a 16 foot tapeworm, the longest I've ever seen in one piece it came out. <laughs> she put it in a jar and sent the jar nicely packaged to the professor back and say, listen, here is the tape worm, worm that you said I didn't have that Dr. Klinger diagnosed. Uh, the amazing thing that happened that we never heard from the professor again. So here you go. So, um, so we got worms and we got the monocellular parasites. And um, one of the, the main treatments that I will be recommending now, I'm here at the clinic in Mexico. One of the things that's easily available here is nitazoxanide. Nitazoxanide has different brand names. In Mexico, the brand name is Daxon. Uh, in the US, the brand name is Alenia. In some parts of Europe, it doesn't exist at all. But uh, nitazoxanide is an absolutely fantastic tool because it treats uh, giardia, amoebas, it treats toxoplasmosis, and it treats a lot of the worms. So it's one remedy that treats both the monocellular and the multicellular parasites. So for those of you who have access to it in Mexico, you can get it without prescription in the pharmacy. You know, the proper dose, i just say that here, the you know, proper dose is one gram twice a day for an adult for 10 days in a row. Then we like to always take a break of seven to 10 days and then do another 10 days. That's the basic treatment. And then that may have to be repeated a few times over the years because parasites lay eggs, they have cysts, they survive, they slowly hatch out and you wanna kill off generation after generation of this. So uh, rule number one in parasite treatment, one parasite treatment will make the patient incredibly better and look incredibly good, but don't, keep your eyes off it. You know, you once parasite, always parasite, you keep your eyes on it and do repeated treatments over the years. Um, so here's an article in Nature from 1993, which you, by the way, will be observing the best articles on parasites were all written in the 1980s, 1990s. And suddenly in the last 20 years, there's no more parasite problems in the world because none of the Western magazines uh, the big ones like Science, Nature, or this, 
um, Journal of the American Medical Association, they do not report on parasites anymore because obviously it's not an issue anymore. Parasites have suddenly retreated from the papers. Um, so it's important to know how parasites establish themselves in us. Um, and there is a whole range of mechanisms that parasites are using. We know that, uh, and I do that too, we treat ulcerative colitis now with giving the patient one single egg of what's called the whip uh, tapeworm. It's a, it's a worm that kind of gets about as long as an earthworm. It's a single worm that hatches out in the colon, um, doesn't make babies, but what it does, it produces a number of biotoxins of substances that um, decrease the activity of the immune system in the colon and in that way heals ulcerative colitis. Also has some effect for Crohn's disease. Recently, we've been using a different a group of uh, tiny, tiny helminths of worms to treat uh, pans and pandas and autistic children with fantastic results. But these are exceptions. You know? So some worms we can use therapeutically for the immunosuppressive activity, but most uh, worms are causing uh, symptoms that can be mild to severe. And so it's always best to treat the bad worms and ask the bad parasites first to get rid of them before considering treatment with good worms. And so far, there's only two species that are used amongst an estimated 200,000 species of parasites that are affecting the human condition. Um, the study on cats and dogs, so about half of the cats have at least one significant parasite. Um, and the dogs, it's a little bit less, it's about one third of the dogs tested in these different studies in the US have significant parasites. You know, this is, I think most cat owners don't know that, you know, that the chance that their cat has a uh, as a parasite that could infect them and the children and cause significant illness in the family. Most animal pet owners don't know that. And so dog owners are much better at knowing that once a year, at least they should do parasite treatment. According to Klingert, it's at least twice a year. But most cat owners do not know that, that their cats are much more dangerous to them than a dog. And cats should at least twice a year be dewormed. Okay, so why are parasites most often not symbiotic? Why don't they behave in ways? Because they depend on our survival to be in us. And so here's a, it's a repetition from two weeks ago, but one is that our own immune reactions against the pathogens cause trouble in our system. You know, even the worms are there to, or the parasites are there to not harm us, to live with us but our own immune reactions can cause severe illness uh, in us. And then the second part, big part is that the uh, parasites excrete uh, certain biotoxins to modulate our immune system and to modulate our nervous system. And those effects can be change our behavior. It can change our overall health, our dynamic health, and it can even cause cancer. And I have certainly examples of that, uh, I think I shared uh, two weeks ago. And then uh, the more known effect, the more feared effect is the competition for our micronutrients. And so we, we see in uh, people that have larger parasites like a tapeworm, that typically get a depletion of vitamin B12, very severe macrocytic anemia. Um, but on the monocellular ones, interesting, they typically cause an iron deficiency. So you get the microcytic anemia, the red blood cells being too small from a lack of iron. So there's some things, some tips in the lab we're getting and we get a little bit more into that. And then of course, the parasites can cause severe blockages. You know, So we had several patients that came back from India. They um, couldn't poop anymore, like complete near lethal, near deadly constipation, and then put them on antiparasitic drug, and then um, a tennis ball 
full of convoluted worms came out that's ascaris, you know, causing a complete ileus, complete obstruction of the gut. But that can happen also in lymph vessels, you know, where people get the lymphedema in the leg or in the arm uh, caused by that. So these are some of the mechanisms that are more well known that, that we need to watch out for. Here's a, um, a page just of some of the typical biotoxins that are not only created by bacteria and fungi and worms, but all the uh, microorganisms that establish uh, domicile in our body all use similar uh, toxins to modulate our system to make us a comfortable host. And um, I'm not going to go into that because that's futile. Um, what I want to point out, and did last time, at the bottom here, you see a chapter of a book uh, from Johns Hopkins University that has my chapter in it on biotoxins. So if you want to read more about it, you can. <laughs> I'm going to just show you that I, I tried at least to get some of the things out in the literature that I know. OK, so now how do I have the boldness to claim that parasites are common in the Western world and not just a problem in Africa? Well, here's a nice abstract from PLOS, one of the highest ranked scientific journals. Yeah, and so first of all, it states that they, they're used as samples of Western countries. They use the 11 nuclear weapon states. Yeah, so the 11 countries that have nuclear weapons. And I think they exempted North Korea from this study. Yeah. And so they basically found all the parasites that are common in Africa and in the underdeveloped world, but also find these parasites in the most westernized, westernized countries. And so I highlighted here some of the, the sentences in there. Yeah. So that it is understood that having parasites impairs the child's physical and intellectual development. Outcomes of pregnancies, that's a huge issue. And worker productivity, you know, so when somebody has parasites, they don't have energy to really do their job well. And then down at the bottom, I have like selected areas in the US, you know, and so selected areas of poverty, of course, they have to put that in there. But where is the selected area of poverty in the US? Well, my half-life is in Seattle <laughs> and we have the largest homeless population in the US. And that is considered an area of poverty. And I'm asking the question, if you have a homeless person in the mall in Bellevue where only rich people go in and out and the homeless person coughs and sneezes and probably has a dog there with them that poos and pees somewhere in the corner. Um, do the parasites of that person stay in that person <laughs> because the person is poor? Or do the parasites find their way into the affluent rich people that go there too? I, I clarify the issue in a moment. You know, and so the parasites are looked at here in Western countries are the helminth infections. These are worms, leishmaniosis. Chagas disease, toxoplasma, and trachoma. This uh, trachoma affects the eyes and causes blindness. They're all there, just um, since we're not looking at it, and I discussed last week, since we have very, very poor diagnostic tools, uh, we don't find it unless the students of mine, they use our parasite DVD, and we can very easily find and diagnose parasitic disease and treat it. Um, so um, here's an article that shows that basically in all the bodies of water in the US, we have Jardia. There's not a single river or lake where there's no Jardia. And as I discussed last uh, two weeks ago, that Jardia has an acute form where it causes diarrhea, but in the chronic form causes constipation. And how many of you listening to this right now struggle with chronic constipation? And how many of you have looked at, could it be that this is chronic jardia, chronic jardiasis? And I bet you haven't. And it is so common. And remember the treatment, the simple treatment is my treatment with Alinea you know, or Daxon or Nitazoxanide is a generic name that I gave you at the beginning. 
yes, you can treat it with natural things, and I will get to that very soon. Yeah, but the drug treatment is always easy. One pill or two pills, you take a couple of times a day and you're done. The natural treatment are a little bit more complex, sometimes more effective, sometimes less effective. Here's a beautiful article that I love just for the title of it. Stupidity or worms? Do intestinal worms impair mental performance? You know, so this is actually a review study and here that shows <coughs> that pretty much all the worms are interfering with your mind, with your intelligence, with their mental performance. All of them do. You know, they're making you dumb. And in children, it's very, very um, incredible the experience when you take a whatever an eight or ten year old who is underperforming in, in, in school, and you put them on a parasitic treatment for ten days, and they come from a D student become an A student virtually overnight. I've seen that so many times, and uh, of course, doing the antiparasitic treatment for autistic children has been a revolution, has been fantastic. You know, I know Carrie Rivera, who is a friend, she wrote a book using chlorine dioxide on it as an antiparasitic, which does work, but it's not popular amongst physicians because we've been reprimanded for using it. But we can use a linear, as it's called in the US, nitazoxanide, and getting phenomenal improvements in the status of the autistic children. And not that they're retarded, you know, that's a completely different set of things, but the brain is affected by something. And um, there's certain drugs that have an incredible beneficial effect on that. Okay, now I want to get to how come that even affluent people can be affected by worms. So I'm not going to go into the uh, details of this, but I was involved actually in treating some of these people. So there was an outbreak of um, uh, wealthy Jewish people in New York City that suddenly developed a seizure disorders. And one of my friends had consulted with me and I said, listen, with seizures, always, always look for cystic psychosis. These are tapeworm larval stages in the brain, always look for that. And so did, and they found it. <laughs> I found that this outbreak in the Jewish community was caused by tapeworms migrating to the brain. And so uh, then they tracked it down to that all of them had helped us uh, from South American countries, from Asian countries that helped in the household. And through those avenues, uh, they became uh, intermediate hosts of these tapeworms and got a severe illness from it, which is, you know, once you treat it, um, you, you get well again, you know, and so I just want to say one thing, you know, so if you have uh, tapeworm larval stages in the brain called neurocystic psychosis, um, when you treat the people with antiparasitic remedies, there's only two medical antiparasitic remedies, one is called albendazole, and the other one is this Taxon, uh, Alenia, or the generic name Nitazoxana, there's only those two that are known to cross the blood brain barrier to actually reach them. But once you do and you kill the worms off where they are, people get severe, sometimes life threatening seizures. And so to prevent that, we put people on a course of steroids. Um, we just give them eight milligrams of dexamethasone. Um, probably on day two or day three, that's sort of when the die-off starts, starts happening and then nothing bad will happen. But unfortunately, my colleagues in the medical environments, as I mentioned two weeks ago, didn't know that and have um, killed or hurt a lot of people by not doing it right. Um, so um, there's an issue here with Lyme disease that I want to point out. You know, some of you know that my passion for the last 30 years or 40 years has been treating, diagnosing and treating Lyme disease and people with chronic fatigue or chronic weird neurological symptoms. And so then we found out when people, in, according to my diagnostic criteria, have both parasites and Lyme, if you treat the Lyme first without addressing the parasites, 
You treat the Lyme, they get better. The moment you stop the Lyme treatment, everything is back, often within a few days. And as it turned out, and this is uh, confirmed here in this, uh, this uh, report and studies uh, that were done, that worms themselves get infected with Lyme disease. So they become carriers of Lyme disease. And if Lyme is inside a worm, the antimicrobial treatments that you use for Lyme disease will not kill the Lyme inside the worm. So the worm is a protection for the Lyme spirochetes. And so when you kill the Lyme outside the worm, fine, you clean up the system, but you won't clean it up inside the worm. And this has then emerged into a whole uh, teaching that when you find large parasites in a person and mold and bacterial infection like Lyme and viruses, you treat the big ones first. You start with the antiparasitic treatment, then you treat the mold, and then you treat the bacteria, and then you treat the viruses. And that order you know, that has been fantastic as a general recipe. Sometimes you have to do a short treatment of one of the smaller ones first to get control of the system, but you will not get the patient well until you go back and treat the worms first and then the monocellular ones, the molds and the giardia, the amoebas and the toxoplasma, and then the smaller ones. Okay, and so this was a big one for us. Like some of you know my teaching around CCSVI, many uh, chronic neurological conditions, especially Parkinson's, multiple sclerosis, uh, Alzheimer's disease, have one thing in common that is less and less known in medicine that the venous drainage, the deep veins in the neck that drain, uh, they have the job to drain the blood from the brain are greatly obstructed. They have narrow places in them from chronic immune reactions, reacting with something that's sitting inside the veins. And what's sitting inside the veins is mentioned here in this paper, it's uh, retroviruses, it's a parvovirus, it's a cytomegaly virus, it's a, a herpes zoster virus, a chickenpox virus, it's staph, it's rickettsia, one of the co-infections of Lyme disease, it's treponema, treponema pallidum, that's the syphilis causing spirochete, and Borrelia are mentioned here, not solicited by me, but these are found in the deep neck veins and of course, where the bugs are, if they settle in the inner lining of the blood vessels, you get strong immune reactions. And the immune reactions then strangulate the, the, the diameter of the vein gets smaller and smaller. And then the blood that flows in the brain can come out. And so the body then self-regulates it, that less blood goes in the brain, only as much as can flow out. And what you get is an underperfusion of the brain and a large number of areas of oxygen and nutrients and the brain starts starving and starts slowly dying. It's many of us are in that stage. And so what is mentioned here at the very bottom that they also found microscopic or not so microscopic stages of virtually all the parasites are mentioned so far in the inner lining of the blood vessels. Of course, there is no place for a 16 foot tapeworm but they find the DNA of the 16 foot tapeworm inside the blood vessels in the front of the neck. In a lot of us, this is not a rare thing. And so I'm um, <clears throat> putting this out to you. Um, I know any parasitologist or infectious disease uh, specialist who listen to this now thinks Klinger is mad because it's not reflected in our medical papers that we're reading every day. And since we haven't looked at it, it can't be true. So I put it out as this is my personal experience with patients and space largely based on ART testing and wherever we could be confirmed it with lab testing, but it's not generally known how widely spread these issues are. Okay, so <laughs> then let's get to the rogue parasites, all right? This is a sample of something a patient of mine delivered. It's about 45 or 50 centimeters long. Um, on top, you see a thing that looks a little bit like a gel, jello mass that actually behaves like a head. 
and then at the end you see that clearly has an end and then the question was is this really a parasite or is this biofilm that the patient expels the so let's start from a clinical point of view when this comes out of a patient and we get what you have to do for that if it comes out of the patient the patient has amazing medical improvements across the board and so what does it mean well that means that that thing in there was bad for the patient can, can we agree on that at least okay and then um, dr gubarev in russia and then his professor friend of florida um, i'm not free to mention his name because he got in trouble for doing research on this and got together and examined the paid the eighty thousand dollars or so for doing a genomic analysis of this thing and it turns out no it's not a parasite in the classic way that means it's not the same dna in every cell in this creature is and then when i looked at the dna there's a dna of of virtually every parasite in the world in there there's a dna of bacteria and there. there's a dna of fungi and there the dna of viruses so it is a biofilm but it's a biofilm that has evolved to behave as if it's a creature it can propel itself like an intelligent animal that uses gas propulsion that means it's basically let me say it in plain english at the low party at the low end it creates gas bubbles and expels them like a fart and that propels this whole thing forward and people feel that movement the people that have this thing in in the colon usually this can be in the small intestine feel the movement of it and they swear to the psychiatrist i'm not crazy mr psychiatrist i've been sent to you because my medical doctor thinks i'm crazy but i feel this thing moving and it sure is and so um, we relate to it as a rope parasite or rope worm and a lot of chronically ill people have it and they're better off getting rid of it and so the first of course the, the first attempt should be to do this with antiparasitic uh, medication and the, the the problem with that is you know because it's lives in the end of the gut it's best to try to expel it with enema type of therapies rather than with drugs from the top. Drugs from the top may dissolve the head of it or part of the body, but it will not expel the whole thing. You know, so enema therapies, and we get into the details of that, the Gubarev protocols and the, the intra, the rectal use of chlorine dioxide and other things, we, we'll get into that. You know, I may not end my parasite talk today. There may be, I'm may get to a certain point i decided not to rush this you know because for many of you you have a vague understanding of what's there and what parasites are but i want to give you download to you like my whole everything i have to say about it so <clears throat> this is a case i was involved with a kid um that never uh traveled outside the u.s um it's a young child, 15 months old, that had the strange swelling on the foot and the mother swore that she saw movement in there. They saw the thing actually changing its position. So anyway, it was surgically opened up and pulled out with a, a good inch and a half long worm. And that ended the saga of this kid that lasted for about six months, going from doctor to doctor to doctor. The mother had to undergo psychiatric evaluation um, because it was absolutely clear that she induced this phenomenon in her child by some kind of strange projection. Anyway, it was a living parasite um, acquired in the US. Okay, so when should we suspect that our patient has parasites? Well, there is certain tips here that I've learned. You know, so published is worms in men, certain worms in men definitely increase risk-taking behavior. It's most known with toxoplasmosis, which is a single cellular uh, parasite that settles in the brain. You come from cats usually, 
so many cat. The question is when you have a 20 year old who does insane things with the bicycles, jumps from cliff to cliff or takes risks. First question I ask is, did this kid grow up with cats in the house? Yeah, I was one of those kids. <laughs> and then in women, interesting enough, it induces docile behavior. They meet a stranger in the on the street and the stranger says, well, would you come home with me? I really need some company. And she says, oh, yeah, yeah, I feel for you. You're such a sweet guy. I come home with you. <laughs> yeah, that's um, the signature of parasites because parasites and, and let's say it in cruel ways, you know, sort of, we had a, a bad example of that was a German, the famous German goalkeeper, brilliant goalkeeper. Um, who committed suicide by throwing himself in front of a train and turned out later on that he had toxoplasmosis. Why that kind of suicide? Well, what happens when you throw yourself in front of a, a train, your whole body splatters into a thousand pieces um, in the neighborhood. And then the rats come, the, the birds come, they pick up a little bit. And the parasite that was confined to one domicile before is now in a thousand animals and gets spread across uh, the country. And so the parasite induces behaviors, in this case, even suicides that serve the propagation of the parasite. And the same, of course, the docile behavior in women, um, you know, if the woman gets murdered in cruel ways because of that, um, the chances are also that her body parts get but let's not get too visual about this. And then, so in men, of course, the risk-taking behavior also will serve the propagation of the parasite. The parasite may die in the host in that way, but the, uh, the offspring of the parasite has huge advantages. So that's, um, in parasites, we usually observe unpredictable eruptions of strange awkward behavior that that makes no sense yeah um that is not intelligent and is awkward and and feels psychotic but erupts in a moment and then a few hours later or a day later it's gone again and you have a completely normal person in front of you um that cannot explain you what happened the day before lime is different yeah? lime you have these episodes of rage and depression. You know? The same mood may last for a few days or weeks, but not minutes like it does in worms. Um, and then even the sickest person has episodes where you can actually talk to them and where they're nice and where they apologize for the behavior they had on their last visit. You know? And so that's a clear difference from the worm behavior and then um, in both men and women, one thing that's published is that um, not every Lyme patient has it, but it's very typical that Lyme patients easily get infatuated in inappropriate ways. You know, people that are in a good marriage, solid marriage, and she gets completely infatuated with the priest or with the mailman or something like that, or, or he gets inappropriately uh, infatuated with somebody else where this actually makes no sense to the onlooker why him why they're in a great relationship before you know so um be aware of that and be forgiving when you see that and uh, instead of judging is trying to diagnose Lyme disease in this paper you know? and then mold again is different mold um the, the mood changes and mold the depression and the fatigue is often connected with the real dullness of the brain. Um, and a tip of it is, you know, when people go in a moldy home, suddenly it comes the whole mood changes in response to the mold inhaled in, in a building. Um, and they're often, you know, are chronic, irritated as long as they're in the moldy environment. And some of them are immediately better when they're out of the, the building. I have some shocking stories I could tell you, but um, this belongs more into my mold uh, talk, mold experience. You know, so with mold, you, you typically get the tip off from people that, that they are highly sensitive to moldy environment 
and can tell you when they get worse and can uh, and escape on their own, use your own intelligence to escape from the moldy environment um, as much as they can. Okay, and then metal toxicity is yet another issue that we have to consider. These are paper, people typically drawn to the dark or, or evil, you know, to, to um, the weird, awful, scary stuff in the spirit world or you know, the darkness that um, people can be drawn to, the metabolic, uh, the diabolic uh, things. Okay, I don't want to get too much into it. Lots of patients experience with that. And then, interesting, yeah, they're very often drawn to artificial environments. Yeah, so when you offer them, would you rather have um, a hike in some pristine mountains or go to Disneyland? There's no question. They say, what will I do in the mountains? What will I do on the beach? No, I'm going to go to Disneyland or I'm going to go to a hard rock cafe and, and you know, stay up all night. That's more the signature of um, heavy metals. Now, there is a relationship between heavy metal toxicity and parasites. And I will get into that very deeply towards the end of my talk. Um, probably not today, yeah, but there is a clear relationship. And I can maybe say that, that uh, parasites um, need a certain milieu, a certain environment in us to exist in us. And parasites are very, very much drawn to heavy metal environments and exist in that area. And a good antiparasitic treatment will always involve metal detox. So sometimes um, this last bit that I'm saying here can be the tip off also to look for parasites or vice versa. The parasite behavior can be a tip off to look at heavy metals. Okay, so how do you make the diagnosis? It's only 45 minutes. Yeah, okay, so I'm reminded that I should end my, my talk soon. So let me just go through this last thing. So how do you make the diagnosis? So first of all, there's uh, signs. Um, skin rashes are typical, fatigue, strange, weird neurological uh, symptoms. Yes, the travel history can be a tip off. I heard a lot of people that made a trip to South America for two weeks or six weeks and had a bit of diarrhea, but then recovered. And then a few months later, they got the weird symptoms. Yeah. Um, biting insects. Yeah, we found uh, very good evidence in the literature that any insect that gives you Lyme disease can also give you the DNA of parasites that will slowly over months and years grow. History of the diet, um, the lungworm in Hawaii is very common. People eat fresh vegetables and they have these tiny microscopic snails on the backside and they carry this virus strongulus clapaui and other uh, microscopic uh, worms that are horrible. They can migrate to the brain and cause meningitis encephalitis and kill the host. Um, it's very widespread in Hawaii. It's a very serious problem. The Hawaiian doctors are all aware of that. Um, then uh, mistaken you know, uh, gut symptoms are typically the early exposure to a parasite, but not the chronic symptoms. Yeah, But constipation is most common. Leaky gut uh, can be when the parasite moves higher up. Physical exam, we find this paleness around the mouth very often. It's called perioral paler. And then we can palpate the gut and the liver. The liver is typically harder. And the gut has single loops in it that are kind of hard and chronically inflamed. Um, a challenge test we use, I like the colonoscopy prep. It's basically a drink that gives you diarrhea to clean out the gut. And so, uh, we like uh, to give that plus a large dose of an antiparasitic, either plant-based or medical antiparasitic. So um, you give that first, let that sit there for a day, and then give the colonic prep and create diarrhea. And then you look at the poop and see if you find anything. That can be helpful. Not every parasite comes out that way, but some do. 
and you want to look over a few days because sometimes it takes a week before something comes out after that. And then talking about lab, I think I'll do a little bit more about that next time, but basically the, the best you can get in a lab is maybe of the 100% parasites that your patients may have, at most you can find 10%. I think it's more like 1% that you find. And there is basically the stool analysis, and then there is the saliva analysis where you can currently look for five or six different species of parasites the, for the DNA in the saliva. And it's a bit more helpful um, than things that we've had before. The antigen antibody-based tests are very good. It's still evolving. Um, I know Dr. Stater right now in the US has a pretty good parasite test. Um, you got diagnostics in Seattle, they're very good with toxoplasmosis and giardia, but lousy with the worms. And so I would say this, um, if you want to do stool testing, forget the, the lab core, the commercial ones, you know, but the specialty labs, if you send the same poop to three different labs, which we've done, you will get three different um, results back. And so you can build them, you can add them to each other, and you may find uh, what's causing the, the ailment of your patient, but chances are you won't. And because it's so discouraging to the patient to do all this testing and then comes back negative, this patient will be less likely to take your antiparasitic regime than the patient where you got this kind of say, well, let's, listen, let's just try this and see what happens. Good. And then um, ART has been a fantastic tool for this. And those of you who have taken ART, in ART3, we teach how to diagnose parasites with our DVD and other methods. And then the general lab. So in general, if somebody has significant parasitic disease, their white blood count will be under 5,000. They will have slightly elevated monocytes, usually between eight and 12. And in 25% of folks, the eosinophils will be three or more. But my tip off for you is what I use personally, if the monocytes are anywhere, so even between seven and upwards from there, and the eosinophils are two or more, that's for me, and the white blood count is 5,000 or less, those three things together, that's for me establishes the likelihood that parasites are involved with this patient. Um, we know that uh, eosinophils should be zero in a normal healthy patient, you know, and even an elevation to two or three uh, indicates there's something ir irritating the immune system. I know there is many other opinions out there, but I've um, just did the juxtaposition of these lab works with my ART-based findings and then the therapy results. And I found this is an unknown triad of symptoms. The low white blood count, the relative within the normal range, but the monocytes being in the high upper range of normal and the eosinophils are being a little bit elevated. You know, that's sort of, and it's very common. Yes, physicians say, hey, I see that all the time. Yes, parasites are very, very common. So, I'm reminded to stop here, so I will. So we will, next Thursday, I will hopefully get to the therapy part. I did a little bit today with the nitazoxonide. Here is the, amongst the medical drugs, the safest, bestest, um, that also treats viruses, also treats COVID-19. You get a lot for the price of one. If you're in Mexico, you can get it for almost nothing without prescription. In the US, it's extremely expensive. Um, but you can get it on insurance. And, uh, but I will give you the natural solutions that we always prefer uh, next week. So with this, I say goodbye and hope that you enjoy these talks. I, I know this is a bit lengthy, and, um, but I want to sharpen your, your eyes, your view, and also your self-perception and your perception of the people around you. And, um, the current environmental conditions that we have, the Wi-Fi environment and the toxicity of aluminum in the air are drivers of a huge increase in parasitic disease. And um, to go forward with humanity, forward in the future, 
we need to have an eye on that. So with that, bye-bye until next week. Thank you, Dietrich, and thank you, everyone, for being with us. And uh, again, thank you, special thanks to Dr. Tony Himmels, I manage at the uh, Hope for Cancer Clinic and his team to make us feel so welcome. Thank you. Bye-bye now.